Yeah, I guess uh, I just want to start my talk uh, uh, asking the audience to guess uh, from where I'm from, but fortunately I'm from Ch I'm in Chennai right now. Uh, thanks to Shreyas and Jainab uh, for bringing the Haski to Chennai and welcome to Metro Space. I call it Metro for the name of it. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Kiran Darisi and uh, I'm the co-founder and the director of technical operations uh, for Freshworks. Uh, previous in one of the first days. Um, yeah, it's a fancy name, so that what uh, the title means is uh, if the site is known, they will throw a column. That's the agenda of it. Okay? So let me uh, tell you how I want to put this talk to. So I will tell you why we chose the cloud and uh, how we architected the cloud. And for the past some seven years being on the public cloud, what are the learnings we have, and what's the future, and what is cooking in first place right now. I will just give you glimpse of uh, uh, what is then and what is now uh, with fresh test. Yeah, you're seeing that you come from the wall. Okay, that gives us uh, more energy, right? At least in China. Okay, so the first one is the uh, scenario of, uh, a happy scenario of living with string layers, right? You have your couple of application servers, you have your DB and batch processing, and uh, those are the happy days what we have. And the next thing, what you see, the more complex architecture of Freshdesk right now, with more layers, lot of microservices, and uh, microservices talking to each other, and uh, what's not, all the other microservices. So these are some metrics right now we have at Freshdesk. You know, you can think of it as a show off slide, right? So, like how, many, how much we do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, uh, the best uh, line I like in this slide is, uh, uh, half a billion requests we capture for a week for a B2B market. At least I feel that's a great thing, right? And uh, more shops, right? This is on a scale of the timeline. Like how much we did on 2012. I haven't categorized 2011 because we just uh, released a GA in the middle of 2011. And uh, until 20, 2017, right now, we are rearing the end, right? This was putting 2018 as a futuristic approach. I just put uh, that. This was the software we just added on year over years. Uh, it's just an append on mode and uh, uh, not replaceable. So you can say that you combine all this, append all this in an array. So that is the number of softwares uh, we use right now at uh, Freshdesk. Okay, moving on to why we chose cloud, right? So, uh, our, at least the initial team, the six of us, we are from a developer background. So uh, three of us are the developers of the first six. And uh, we all have a developer background and we don't have any ops knowledge. So we like to choose the infra where infra can be easily repeatable and can repeat multiple times. And uh, also it can be configurable easily, okay? Because we don't want a lot of uh, uh, ad hoc systems where you want to configure, go and uh, do the things and all that. So we chose the safest and uh, most easiest option that is PaaS, Platform as a Service. We chose Engineer. And uh, Engineer runs on AWS, but uh, it gives a pre-built uh, cookbooks where you can just say that, okay, give me a couple of app servers, give me one DB instance and one monad for uh, the DB instance for the backup and one uh, uh, background system for emails. Like that, you just need to select on the UI, it will just appear. And the other point is, uh, we are pretty new uh, for the hardware itself. So when you architect, so we need to know that for an R server, what is the best hardware we like to use it, right? So, and so uh, this AWS has an array of instance classes. You have a CPU, you have this much of RAM or whatever. Uh, so we need to experiment on which instance class we to use it to to, uh, to get that experimentation done for the cheaper price, so the app public cloud is the one. And when you go to a data center, which is a physical data center I'm speaking, uh, uh, we need to know how many servers will be managed by one day. Okay, that is how they market. It's like for 1,000 servers, they will have one day to look after it. Whether it's then the connectivity, it can be power, it can be backup, whatnot, right? So for everything, so you need a server to man ratio. For a six-member team who is doing a development and also ops, uh, we didn't feel much of it. And uh, to tell you the truth, uh, we didn't have much of money to start a physical data center, right? Which was the 
public cloud for it. And why, when we chose the public cloud, we, we went with some basic principles. So I call it as a DevOps triangle. Uh, DevOps is a overrated word these days, right? So, uh, but still I use a DevOps uh, word here. Uh, so you have cost, you have performance and the availability. I can throw an infinite amount of money and achieve 100% uptake. But still I won't reach the unit of economics for a SaaS company, right? Because I'm running SaaS for, for a reason. Uh, so I can't throw in a lot of money into it. And as a developers or uh, product, as a product owners, we need to understand what are the critical parts on your system and what are not. So we need to uh, define, okay, my email system, my email sending system should, should be okay for a 99, okay? And say my phone system, which is so critical, you can't get it out. I need, I need four nines of SLA. So you need to allocate there. So that is how we need to strive for the cost. So that is the magic. So this is the equilateral triangle, it can't have one dimension to exponential increase. So you need to have, uh, uh, it's, it's, should be equilaterally enhanced. Even for the performance, we can say that uh, for a ticket uh, ticketing system like uh, Frescas, so how much time it takes for ticket to create? So that is, uh, say, 200 milliseconds. So you can even do it in 50 milliseconds, but whether it's worth it, whether the, it's worth the cost, or else the time of the uh, uh, developer, right? So uh, uh, we need to, uh, based on it, we need to say, okay, this much cost I can actually send. Uh, spend and uh, this is this how much uh, performance I need. This is the availability metrics I have. So once we have this basic principles, we move on to uh, architecting the cloud and architecting the part for the cloud, for the public cloud. So how many of you know this? Uh, so uh, it's a famous Simeon army from Netflix, right? So where uh, you, uh, it will just go and uh, knock off all the uh, instances or switch off the databases, but still. Uh, you need to be highly available. But I don't know why Netflix spent that time and uh, did it right, where AWS gives for free. Okay, so you can't trust a share base for anything. So any instance, right, it will just reboot, it will just go off. Your EBS volume will stop working and uh, your IOPS will go off. So uh, first we thought of HR on every layer. So it can be an immutable system or an immutable system or a data storage system. Say, for example, we chose the RTS. At least on the master, we have a multi AC. And uh, we have uh, Redis, uh, we, some of our parts we use Elastic Cache, which has an uh, fallback. And some of the parts we use Redis Lab, which runs in a custard mode. And uh, once you chose on a public cloud, uh, before I told you which instance class to use it, right? When you, when you run your load tests on your uh, public cloud, like AWS, it all depends on who is your neighbor. Okay, because we are running in a VM. Another VM sitting next to you, say if it is Flipkart, definitely on the morning times, you will see a degraded performance. So all the performance what you get is not proportional to what they promise. Like the number of RAM or CPU is not the same thing. It all depends on how much uh, the other guy is putting the noise. So, uh, so we always did the load testing on dedicated instances. Even we need to spend 30% more for it. We just sit down, you know, take it and see that is how you know that, okay, for this workload, this is the right instance class we need to use. And from the day zero, I mean, day zero can be debated, so at least for uh, first test, it's uh, from two years after starting, we started from the templates. Uh, we started templating the infra. Um, um, as, I told, as I told, we want the infra to be repeatable. <coughs> it's the best way to repeat the infra. You need to have the templates. So that if you want to boot another layer, okay, this is how you need to boot it. The templates uh, is thing. We started with the recipes, but we went to the cloud formation. Now we are on Terraform. Uh, uh, after two years of starting, so the, from starting, we haven't wrote any bash scripts or any uh, Linux uh, scripts to just run our environment. We start using the uh, just from the early days, and. Um, we, do the, we thought of uh, horizontal scaling at all layers, right? So I will quote something. So the early investor in Prestes um, asked me in the early days, uh, Kiran, when are you starting? I asked him, it's actually, don't you know Moore's law? So it's like uh, RAM is going to be cheaper on a day-to-day -day basis, even the hardest, right? So why I need to start? So I will just vertically scale the system because 
the day before I read some blog post from Hudson Signals where uh, Jason Fry told uh, you should never shard your system, shard your database because it adds your complexity at all layers of your application. But at this point, Festus is sharded with double number defects. We have retained the attitude and uh, we said we shard it. Uh, uh, think of, you need to think of horizontal scaling at, at all the levels. It can be uh, database systems or your search systems, we use Elasticsearch for it. And uh, yeah, definitely new, immutable systems like application servers, you don't need uh, horizontal scaling, right? You can ju just boot up anything under your HA proxy, it will scale. And uh, at least from uh, if your uh, product needs some, uh, reaches some production scale, it can be money or number of users. You need to think of at least DR uh, for uh, your data storage system because uh, if your entire US East region is gone, if you want to go to US West, it, 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 the uh, data storage systems are the most uh, time, uh, time taking things to actually come up with. And uh, yeah, we are kind of architected uh, for the cloud and uh, we are running in the cloud, right? But um, how do how you actually measure it? Um, so, when I say measure, right, so it's not only performance or uh, availability for the end customer, we need to even take care of cost. Uh, we essentially use Netflix size and also our own homegrown tools for the costing. Uh, we need to start, we started allocating the budgets for team. Uh, at this scale, Freshness has 40 different uh, AWS accounts. We use AWS organizations for uh, handling the, all the uh, uh, AWS accounts we have. And uh, we allocated budgets with respect to revenue. Uh, maybe for some social startups, uh, it can be number of users, right? So you can say for this many X users, we can have this much dollars we can actually spend for it. And uh, for uh, response time and availability, we came up with a new idea called delight metrics. Uh, this we uh, derived ourselves. It's like, say, for example, you take a ticketing system. Uh, there are multiple actions in the product for the consumer. It can be a ticket create or ticket send or uh, update the ticket, something like that. For each action, we kept a threshold. And every day, we monitor something like, so whether we can able to serve at least 95% of the request of those within the threshold. So that is our delay. And combining with uh, number of 500 uh, errors, I would say 5 excess errors, right? Uh, how many 5 excess errors? Should? So the combination of these two is our delight metrics. So we uh, religiously follow this. Uh, we won't showcase to the customers, but uh, because for the customers, they won't, they will only care about whether the app is up or not. Nothing much, right? So we we do it at, internally. This is the delight metrics for each team we have it. And how you monitor all these things, right? So logs is where we we send in all the information. So event we use a lot of event logs, and uh, we send all the event logs to Sumo Logic, uh, where we'll monitor and have alerts to it. So a typical event log looks like for this customer for this action, this much milliseconds it took it, and what is the status for for it? It can be 200, 500, 400, whatever. So uh, that's how we monitor and we set. Alerts in Sumo Logic when it uh, crosses the threshold or the below the threshold. Uh, when I say below the threshold, which means that your microservice is not sending anything or is not serving anything. So when it says, uh, even you need to put a threshold alert when it is when it goes down. So when you start sending alerts, uh, this is when you are gonna wake up all the SRE team in the night, right? So for every alert, you just send a page PG or you send a mail or you just send it. Give it call. You need to come out of the alert fatigue. Uh, like uh, uh, once you get into a lot of alerts, you will start getting the alert fatigue, and you don't even act on the real alert you have. So for that, we have some homegrown tools where we say that a hey, DB is down, so the engineer is acting upon it. We can just go and pass it and say that uh, yeah, I already know the DB is down, so I'm working on it. So I'll pass it for a while, and uh, and I will start and uh, do a play but then after uh, my db is up and uh, we have another uh, 
feature where we actually group the alerts. So once there is an incident, the, for the developer or the SRE person needs to know what exactly happened for that uh, point of time, right? So we group the alerts saying that, okay, this many TV alerts you got, it, this many infra alerts you got, it, this many app alerts you got. It. So for, for them, it will definitely improve the uh, MPP app. So from day zero, uh, Freshdesk is a global company. Predominantly, we, uh, we have the development center in Chennai, but we serve the customers from US and Europe, right? Uh, so that is the best thing where the AWS will come into picture, where you can be near to your customer. So it can be your ELB, your CDN, whatever. But after some certain scale, the customers will want their data to be also with them. With them. That is when the data centers will come. So Germany is our latest data center out of uh, three data centers, what we have. And uh, the data centers or the parts, all these things will uh, work only when you have standardization across the parts. You can't say that in US I will have chat and I don't have chat in Frankfurt or I don't have email in Ireland. And you don't have, uh, you shouldn't have multiple branches of recipes or branches of cookbooks between the data centers. You need to have the same recipe flowing through because you will start, stop, uh, uh, doing the right thing. So when you have multiple branches serving for uh, multiple data centers, I just kept GDPR. That is where that that is what it tells you. It's actually you need to have the data to be decided in your uh, local system. So after being in the cloud, the public cloud for seven years, we have a lot of learnings. I will just uh, tell you some learnings what we have. Being in SaaS and being on public cloud, you need to think of velocity. Okay, that is the only thing will make your business to go forward, right? You need to think of velocity. When I talk about velocity, it's like how fast you can deploy and how fast you can actually know that there is something wrong with the, uh, the deployment and how fast you can roll back. Okay, these three things I actually uh, make sense to being in the cloud and being in the SaaS. That is how we need to actually go. So we call it as intelligent risk. So as an ops day, you don't want any change to be made to your system because it is working and it needs to be working. But as a developer, you need to push the features, right? And when you start pushing the features, that is where you see the birds and birds. So uh, if you are actually tagging your codes, it's really good. But if you are not doing it, start doing it. And you need to start tagging your infra. So now we came to an age where there is no difference between your infra and the code. It's just a time to detect. Right? It's just a marriage which happened and it is not going to be worse. Uh, you need to version the infra in a way that when you roll back your code, even the infra should be rolled back. So there is no point infra just running there or having a different configuration. And in process, we use uh, we do blueprint deployments. That's the easiest way or the safest way, I will say, to push out the uh, changes or the implement the changes. Uh, for the guys who don't know blueprint deployments, it's like you have a blue stack running with your old code, you have your new, new code, so you'll boot up to the similar infra. Uh, you call it as a green stack, and send your one percent of the traffic there and just monitor the other's performance, everything. Once you are okay with everything, so you push the other traffic in stages, like 10, 25, 35, 100. So that is the safest way where you can do it. When I say similar infra, you need to think of uh, even the cache systems or the uh, readies, everything. So you can play around the namespaces and all, but yeah, when you say uh, true infra, you are actually booting up everything. Apart from MySQL, MySQL is a bit uh, tricky to do at blueprint deployments uh, so that your code should be aware of uh, rolling back the schema. It needs to work in the previous schema and the, that's the only caveat to do the blueprint but uh, yeah but you need to have everything up like your background systems, the cache systems, everything and uh, you need, uh, the intelligent proxies helps us a lot of time in uh, diverting the traffic between the parts as well as between microservices. When I say intelligent proxies, why do you use a proxy, right? So we use a proxy for throttling, for the communication, for the connection pooling, 
and whatnot for the security, uh, everything, right? So uh, we use Nginx plus Lua script in a combination uh, for the proxies, but uh, we are evaluating uh, lists in Envoy uh, right now. Uh, that's written in CPT and uh, which is uh, very good right now until now. Uh, we can still not proxenize it. And uh, you need to spend generously for uh, monitoring tools, either it be an APM or a log, alerting, whatever. So as a developer, we have this uh, motion, right? So it's like uh, when you see one uh, one part where you need to pay, you think of whether I can build it, okay? But uh, when you are six people, ten people, or twenty people, that's you can't actually do it. You need to you need to pay for it, even if it's going to cost it. That's going to serve a lot. And if you are on AWS, you need to start paying for the reserved instances, which will give you a thirty percent discount on the front right. At least you can start with your data storage systems like MySQL, which are which are not going to change for one year or two years. For I I would say that you pay for one year, don't pay for three years of reserved uh, reserved instances, uh, because AWS has the habit of uh, releasing new instance classes uh, for every eleven months. It is just the record. I don't know whether they're going to change for six months. This is interesting. So uh, when I say that, it's actually there is no uh, difference between your code and your infra, which means that the developers are are should be in front to actually do the production support. And you can't say that okay, there will be centralized DevOps tools which take care of the availability, and you guys don't need to care. That's not going to work out anymore because when you are there writing the application code itself they need to know okay whether it's highly uh, available or it's horizontally scalable right what systems they need to uh, select out of the bunch we have uh, so uh, we not of the centralized devops team and uh, our developers itself will serve it but we have a small SRE team does only R&D uh, their job is only like, okay, you have something which does only 1x, can we do this thing in 10x? A lot of things will fail, but uh, that is the r and work, uh, we do it. So when you are scaling and you are getting the revenue, you are getting the funding, all these things, one thing that the, the, the most prominent thing what we actually target is uh, security. So at, in public cloud, when you have uh, running on the public cloud and you have a lot of developers developing it. So security is not optional. It should be embedded when you are actually uh, uh, developing the code or doing it. So we use uh, AWS Trusted Advisor uh, for all the accounts. It will tell you two. One is uh, it's actually like uh, whether there is uh, any security incident happens, any permission changes are open to the world. It will tell you, okay guys, these are open to it. And the another thing, uh, they tell it on the cost. That is like, uh, is there any system which is ideally running? I actually put it at the security because the security creeps in when you have the code in legacy mode, where you haven't updated for a while, patched it for a while. Right? Think of some couple of developers just booted up two instances and left it running for a while. Uh, and uh, it's running the legacy code, it never be patched. AWS special browser will tell you that, okay, Dude, there are two instances running with 0% CPU for last 10 days. You like to take an action. It will save us cost as a side effect, but for me, it's, it's more of the security factor. Even you have a right developers and a security team, everything running inside your organization, you need to uh, think of big bug bounty program. Uh, you will earn it, like, uh, Trust me, you learn a lot of things. It's actually can either it can be either code or it can be infra everywhere. You will learn a lot of things when you start a bug bounty. We use Hackathon for it, and we have audit trail enabled from day zero in AWS, where we send even that is an event log. Right? We actually send all this to uh, Sumo Logic and uh, uh, alert us when there is a change in the security group or change in the permission of S S3 bucket. Or uh, is there any uh, modification uh, in the uh, infra service we use? Like all these things will be uh, categorized into audit trail, and then we get the alerts on it. And when you have your developers uh, supporting your production, you can't make them as first level citizens and just go and touch the production or production uh, environment. So you need to have some interface where they can safely go and debug the system. Uh, it's like uh, when um, they can't run a drop query on MySQL, 
you should have an interface where it should restrict them not to run the drop query on a delete query uh, or anything to safeguard your production environment when multiple people are touching it. And it also comes with the PIA data, right? The security where uh, you can't, not everybody can see the PIA data. So you, you need to be certified, all these things are there. And if you are running in AWS, you should run in VPC. There is no matter what, right? And also, uh, at this age, you have multiple microservices talking to each other, have to run in the say, uh, v different VPC, VPCs and do the VPC clearing between them. You need to take care of the CITR ranges, but uh, that's the minimalistic change. You can actually check it in the operability review or whatever, right? And never lose the AWS API keys. So when you start using the API keys, you will be tempted to lose it anywhere. Either the Jitter bar, you'll keep it in some system, you'll keep it in the email, keep it in the chat, whatnot, right? So start using the ropes. The ropes is the way where you can actually say, uh, 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 you, you can actually speak to multiple services of uh, AWS. So these are the learnings we had. Then what is the future and what's currently cooking in Festus? So functions need some production scale or a good scale in terms of revenue or number of users you have. Uh, you need to start thinking of what critical systems you have and what are the services, pre-built services you have. I'll give an example, like say, for a ticketing system, the email is so important, right? And we are we were using SendGrid, but uh, we can't say to the customer, saying that, okay, SendGrid is down, that, so I will be also down, right? So you need to start coming out of your pre-built services, which is so critical to you. We can have non-critical services or uh, something which we just push right now, to use a pre-built service, but once you reach some certain scale, there is no escape. You need to come out and have uh, yeah, your own pre-built services. Email right now runs from uh, Freshness Infra. And you need to start thinking of web agnostic uh, deployment, cloud agnostic deployments. Uh, so some part of our code right now runs from GCP. And uh, as uh, Imran says, there is no escape for it right now. We, need to, we can't just go and attach to one cloud. Uh, you should have multiple clouds. Yeah, we need to still figure out the latencies and what needs to be uh, deployed in the other uh, data centers. But yeah, you need to have uh, this. Thing. And think of homegrown monitoring tools. Uh, at Freshness, we actually use about 2,000 odd instances. And it's not an easy job for a NOT team or a SRT team just go and see that, okay, everything is fine or not. So uh, the, the one which, is, which you are seeing in the uh, left top corner is a tool called Chipkin. So where it, uh, okay, I just made it green, but in the real world scenario, it won't be green, okay? So these are multiple databases we have, where with a single uh, view, where it will tell you if it turns red, which, is, which means that they have some problem. Like that, you can actually extend it to your service, you can extend it to your uh, EC2 instances like that. Okay, with one glance, you are able to tell out of these 100 instances which has a problem. Or which should have a problem. And uh, we need to think of, uh, or we are thinking of the dev productivity. Like how fast a, a developer can push the code out. Uh, so we developed a tool, uh, uh, a tool for the deployment, a pipe to deployment, where uh, the developer just finishes the code and just click on the deployment and just go through it. And it will take care of uh, uh, pushing the code, monitoring it, and doing the blue, green, everything, switching the traffic, everything. Only at the end, if, if it sees some problem, it will just notify the developer, uh, do you want to go and check it out, there might be some problem with your deployment. And uh, you need to start doing the anomaly detection. Say for example, in a B2B uh, market, you can't predict the traffic. Say for an e-commerce, for Flipkart, when they have billion dollar sale, they know that there is a spike in the traffic. For us, say Flipkart is our customer, if Flipkart has a bad day, we will have a spike in the traffic. Maybe a buddy code they pushed it or they have a lot of support tickets. Just like uh, Book My Show, if a robot 2.0 releases, they will have a lot of traffic and internally it triggers uh, fresh test. So we need to think of anomaly detection. It's like uh, threshold based alerts are no more uh, relevant to the system. You need to think of some mathematical function where you say, okay, you have uh, 
uh, this <laughs> kind of a traffic and it's just going beyond what is not expected. Can you have it? Uh, take a look at it and uh, see some parameters, give context to the developers and say, okay, this is what going in your traffic. Okay, I think so that's it from my side. <coughs> Thank you. Still 10 seconds left. Okay. <laughs> but I don't know what place it is. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kira. Um, any, any questions that you have uh, for Kira? Any reason, particularly the AWS and the uh, public cloud, we have also uh, uh, set it uh, for seven years and uh, using it. Yes, uh, uh, to be frank, we haven't uh, uh, did an any analysis on multi cloud. At the point of time, we want to use PaaS. Internet has the only option of either they need to, we need to use their own data center or AWS. So at that point, 2011, there is no real concept use for AWS. So there is only one public shop running. Only this year we are actually doing some analysis across the multiple clubs.